Visiting a new city can be an exciting and enriching experience, but to really get the most out of your stay and not miss any of the most interesting spots, it's best to be prepared. So we've put together a list of 15 bests to explore in some of the greatest cities in the United States to ensure that your trip to each is a truly unforgettable one. Just sit back and let us be your guide, sharing with you 15 travel bests in Washington. Even among major world capitals, Washington occupies a special place. Built on a former marsh along the Potomac River between Virginia and Maryland, Washington has become a true symbol of power. It is here that the American nation's future plays out, and often even that of the entire world. Washington has an undeniable European charm with its many buildings in the classical style. Unlike most major American cities, there are few skyscrapers in its urban landscape, making the city seem somehow more human. Enriched with many parks, green spaces, and beautiful monuments, Washington fascinates and attracts several million visitors every year. People come to visit the institutions of a great democracy, some of the most important museums in the world, and perhaps above all, to relive the United States' exciting and moving history. We haven't got a lot of time to see Washington, but we have made a list of 15 of the city's best to help us in our visit of the capital of the United States of America. Let's start our tour in the National Mall, sometimes called the Soul of Washington. Over three kilometers, or nearly two miles long, this huge park stretches through the city center and includes some of the most important monuments in America, the Capitol, the Washington Monument, and the Lincoln Memorial. The mall is lined with beautiful neoclassical buildings where some of the country's most important museums are found, including the National Gallery of Art, the Museum of Natural History, and the National Air and Space Museum. The Capitol is an extraordinary building. It houses the Senate and the House of Representatives. It's one of the city's most visible landmarks and the best known symbol of Washington around the world. Construction of the building began in 1793, yet as it appears today, the Capitol was conducted in four phases over more than 160 years. Visitors can admire the immense 4,082-ton dome based on the one crowning St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Along with the Capitol and the White House, the Washington Monument is another of the city's famous landmarks. It's an impressive 170-meter or 555-foot-high obelisk. Built of white marble, it's dedicated to George Washington, first president of the United States and father of the nation. Its construction, which began in 1854, had to be suspended during the Civil War and wasn't completed until 1884. This explains the difference in color of the marble structure. An elevator carries passengers to the top, offering a spectacular view of the U.S. Capitol. Located between the Washington Monument and Lincoln Memorial, the National World War II Memorial honors the memory of more than 400,000 soldiers who lost their lives during World War II. 56 columns symbolizing the unity of the American nation border the monument. They represent the 48 states, seven federal territories, and the District of Columbia. Two other monuments commemorate American soldiers. The Korean War Veterans Memorial, and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, both solemn places of quiet and respect. On the banks of the Potomac River, at the far end of National Mall stands the Lincoln Memorial. When Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1865, many called for a monument in his honor, but it wasn't until 1922 that this one was inaugurated. The Lincoln Memorial is inspired by the Parthenon. It has 36 columns, symbolizing the number of member states of the Union when Abraham Lincoln was elected president. The image of the monument dedicated to Lincoln is familiar to all Americans. It's the facade of this building and the likeness of Lincoln that can be found engraved on pennies and printed on $5 bills. Between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument is the reflecting pool. 
This 600-meter or 2,000-foot rectangular pool is an integral part of the city's iconic landscape. It's near here that one of the shining moments of U.S. history took place. In 1963, Martin Luther King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in front of the reflecting pool. The National Mall also holds some unexpected surprises for visitors, such as the statue of Albert Einstein in front of the National Academy of Sciences. The revered scientist is still very popular, especially with young scientists. The statue of Einstein is just one of many public works of art that can be seen around the U.S. Capitol. Let's have a look at some more of them by continuing along the mall to the National Gallery of Art Sculpture Garden. In a peaceful garden in front of the museum, visitors can admire many sculptures by renowned artists. These works, sometimes intriguing and often surprising, are arranged around a central fountain. Sculptor Alexander Calder is internationally known. His works are part of the urban landscape of many cities around the globe. This graceful sculpture that evokes the shape of a horse is aptly named Red Horse. Graft is the latest work added to the park. Acquired in 2009, Roxy Payne's sculpture is a tree with one gnarled and twisted half while the other is smooth. It evokes the human tendency to control nature and the omnipresent tension between order and chaos. Tony Smith's Moondog is a work of architectural and geometrical inspiration that's part of the 1960s minimalist movement. The title Moondog is inspired by a Joan Miro painting entitled Dog Barking at the Moon. The work of Hector Guimard is easily recognized. A member of France's Art Nouveau movement, Guimard created more than 140 metro entrances in Paris between 1900 and 1913. Roy Lichtenstein is a master of pop art known for his works inspired by advertising and comic books. House One shows this very graphic style with its clean lines highlighted with bolder black ones and a palette of primary colors. Since the 1980s, Louise Bourgeois has worked on a series of sculptures exploring the theme of the spider. For the artist, this is an exploration of the loss of childhood with the spider representing a mother figure. Some artists are inspired by everyday objects. Such is the case with Klaus Oldenburg and his work, Typewriter Eraser Scale X. Many visitors don't recognize the object in question, which was widely used before the advent of computers. The garden is also home to the Pavilion Cafe, open year-round and offering light meals and sandwiches. Its architecture is worthy of the works on display nearby. Coming up on our list of Washington Bests, the largest library on Earth and a trip to a secret museum. Our visit to Washington continues on Independence Avenue, east of the Capitol. Let's explore the Library of Congress, located in the Jefferson Building, whose facade is strangely reminiscent of the Paris Opera House. This project was initiated by Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States, who believed that members of Congress should be able to consult reference books on any subject. Considered today to be the largest library in the world, it contains more than 147 million documents in 470 languages. Among the treasures on display here of particular note is the Gutenberg Bible in perfect condition, which was printed in the 15th century and is considered to be priceless. The Jefferson Building's interior is spectacular. The Great Hall, with its imposing size and rich decor, is a true marvel. Diffused lighting highlights the many sculptures and mosaics under the 20-meter high or 65-foot glass roof.
This is a place of great classical beauty, with a subtle yet unexpected blend of influences, such as baseball and football players designed in ancient Greek style. Among the many paintings that adorn its walls and ceilings, there are also several interesting symbols, including the Four Seasons. and the five senses. A sun surrounded by the 12 zodiac signs adorns the floor of the hall. One of the arches is flanked by two figures, a young and old man, each reading. This work reminds visitors that learning never ends. In the library, visitors can see several representations of the goddess Athena, associated with, among other things, learning and wisdom. This goddess is, without doubt, the perfect figure to watch over this temple of knowledge. The mosaic of Athena that adorns the white marble staircase leading to the reading room is simply beautiful. The large reading room is the soul of the Library of Congress. This is where the public can consult works from the immense collection. This room includes a magnificent rotunda flanked by Corinthian columns and decorated with sculptures, gilding, and mosaics. A 49-meter-high or 160-foot dome decorated with frescoes harmoniously crowns the space. The Library of Congress is overflowing with treasures and rare books. Though initially just a tool for parliamentarians, over the years it has become a great repository of knowledge in service of the entire nation. Washington is a city with a long diplomatic tradition, and as in all capital cities, there are embassies from many countries around the globe here. Any talk of historical relationships between nations must surely include the mysterious world of espionage, one which is on display at the International Spy Museum. This museum offers a fascinating journey into the world of those who toil in the shadows. The Spy Museum's mission is to better familiarize visitors with a mysterious profession, one which has perhaps contributed more than we know to world history. The museum has a collection of objects and gadgets used by spies around the world. Most have never been publicly exhibited before. On display are discrete cameras and recording devices. Visitors can also learn pretty much everything about invisible inks, micro dots, and recording sound underwater, along with the art of disguise developed by Hollywood on behalf of the CIA. Among the spy museum's must-sees is the Enigma machine, a coding instrument used by the Germans in the Second World War. Finally cracking its complex code helped accelerate the Allies' victory by letting them decipher the Axis forces' secret messages. Between the two world wars, secret agent stories became very popular with children as well as adults. The industry followed suit by creating hundreds of toys and games based on this theme. The museum has a fine collection of these on display. Amidst the dozens of sophisticated gadgets, a particular note is this suitcase that contains all the tools necessary to uncover a spy. It was designed by the Stasi, the secret service of East Germany, a country where spying was little short of a national tradition. The Cold War is a period of history associated with countless espionage cases. Many of them took place in Berlin, a fascinating city, which had been cut in half, with one side isolated behind the Iron Curtain. The museum features a reconstruction of a tunnel that connected West Berlin to Communist East Berlin. The Spy Museum allows a few small detours from reality. Though featured in a James Bond film, this beautiful Aston Martin car was never actually used in a real mission, yet nonetheless is still an attractive pop culture symbol of espionage. After the Spy Museum, we'll cross the river to Arlington, last resting place of many American heroes.
Let's leave Washington a while for Arlington, Virginia, located directly across the bridge spanning the Potomac River. The Arlington National Cemetery is a vast military cemetery created during the Civil War. The cemetery is visited annually by more than four million people. Among the approximately 300,000 buried here are soldiers from every American war, from the Revolutionary War to more recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is a place of respect and remembrance with thousands of tombs marked with simple, identical, perfectly aligned headstones. Among the most visited graves are those of former President John F. Kennedy and his wife, Jacqueline, who is by his side. Some may find the simplicity of these two graves surprising. Only two black slabs with names engraved mark their final resting place with an immortal flame. Among the long list of well-known people buried in this cemetery is that of Robert Kennedy, whose tomb, like that of his brother, is of a somber simplicity. Reflecting America's collective memory, the Arlington National Cemetery honors the nation's heroes. For example, the monument dedicated to the victims of the 1986 Challenger shuttle explosion while another monument commemorates the loss of the Columbia in 2003. Between the two is a monument dedicated to the eight soldiers who died in Iran in 1980 while attempting to save U.S. Embassy personnel who'd been taken hostage. This is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier of the First World War. It's a special place of meditation where an honor guard marches day and night by the tomb the highest honor a fallen soldier can be given. Let's now head over to the United States Air Force Memorial, located south of the cemetery. Nestled on a hillside near the Pentagon, this monument is one of Washington's best-known landmarks. It's impossible to miss its three steel points that soar to the heavens, the highest of which reaches 82 meters or 270 feet. The monument evokes the launch of three aircraft and represents the Air Force's core trio of values, integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all that is undertaken. The work of architect James Ingo Freed is a tribute to the 54,000 American airmen who have died in service. An honor guard of bronze statues watches over the memory of those heroes who sacrificed their lives for their country. On the ground, surrounded by the three spires, one sees the star that symbolizes the Air Force. At each end of the site, a wall has been erected on which names of Medal of Honor recipients are engraved, alongside a list of places where the Air Force has conducted its operations. In front of one of these walls stands the only representation of airplanes in the memorial, a glass plate showing jets flying in formation, a tribute to all its fallen airmen. The United States Air Force Memorial welcomes more than 200,000 visitors each year and hosts a multitude of events. Among these are remembrance ceremonies, weddings, and concerts by the Air Force Orchestra. We'll move from a place of reflection and remembrance to another as our list of Washington's bests continues. As we continue our exploration of Washington, let's head over to Mount St. Alban, northwest of the city. This is where we'll find the Washington National Cathedral built on a 23-hectare site. 
The idea of building a cathedral was that of celebrated architect Pierre Charles Lanfin in 1791. But his plan didn't actually materialize until 1907, the year of the groundbreaking by President Roosevelt. 83 years after that, in 1990, construction was finally completed. Although this period may seem long, it's relatively short when compared with the construction times of many European cathedrals that often took several centuries. The Anglican Cathedral is officially named the Cathedral Church of St. Peter and St. Paul. Its west front is flanked by two identical towers dedicated to the two saints. The peak of the central tower stands 206 meters or 676 feet above sea level, the highest point in all of Washington. The hand-carved relief above the central portal is the work of Frederick Hart. It is titled Ex Nihilo, which translates from Latin as out of nothing. This work symbolizes creation. The Washington National Cathedral is built in the 14th century Anglo-Saxon Gothic style. Made of Indiana limestone blocks assembled using the medieval building technique of one stone upon another, it has no steel frame and its walls are supported by flying buttresses. This style of construction with its high ceilings allows a great deal of space for windows. Hundreds of absolutely beautiful windows illuminate this sacred enclosure. There are three rosettes. The one over the main entrance is particularly striking. It consists of some 10,500 pieces of glass and eloquently illustrates the passage from Genesis proclaiming, let there be light. The other cathedral windows explore different religious and historical themes. The one dealing with science and technology, the space window, is especially fascinating. Its central circle includes a genuine fragment of moon rock brought back to Earth by the Apollo 11 astronauts. The building's windows provide an extraordinary soft light, helping visitors enjoy the many works of art here. The altar is composed of 110 characters carved in stone surrounding Christ and is a true masterpiece of composition. In addition to biblical characters, some political figures are also represented. There's a marble statue of George Washington, first president of the United States, and one bay dedicated to Abraham Lincoln. If the Washington National Cathedral is a building that celebrates history, it also looks to the future. In fact, many uncut stones have been reserved for future generations, so they may mark their passage in their own way. Hundreds of unusual works of art are also hidden in the cathedral. Careful observation is recommended. You may even want to bring binoculars to help appreciate these subtleties. After a good deal of walking outside of downtown, let's head back into Washington for a little taste of something different. First, we cross over to the U Street Corridor, just a few blocks north of the main Washington Monument, to Ben's Chili Bowl, a small restaurant opened in 1958 by Ben Ali, an immigrant from Trinidad. This area is known as Black Broadway because of its many clubs, from which such luminaries as Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, and Ella Fitzgerald emerged. Even today, it isn't uncommon to see stars drop by for a bite at Ben's Chili Bowl, which in its five decades has witnessed much of the neighborhood's turbulent history. Located in what had been the Black Ghetto back in the days of racial segregation, Ben's Chili Bowl is one of the few establishments still open after the 1968 riots that followed Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. Despite the curfew in place, this restaurant has welcomed and fed all comers, from outlaws to government agents. After the 1970s, the U Street Corridor became a veritable disaster area. Overrun by drugs into the 1980s, it then became a giant construction site in the early 1990s with the construction of the Green Line subway. Through it all, Ben's Chili Bowl has remained open, 
a beacon of light and humanity that illuminated an area desperately in need. Today, after years of struggle, Ben's Chili Bowl has become a local institution. The line of people waiting to be served proves it. Many customers come for the celebrated chili and chili dogs, all prepared and served by members of the founder's family. The interior decor hasn't changed since the day it opened, and house chili is always lovingly prepared using the same secret recipe. Ben's Chili Bowl has drawn locals and celebrities in Washington for half a century. Bill Cosby is one of the restaurant's regulars. And the Saturday after he arrived in the White House, Barack Obama stopped in for the house specialty, chili half smoke. Nicholas Sarkozy and his wife Carla Bruni also lunched here during a visit to Washington in 2010. If you can't make it here, Ben's offers delivery of some of its products throughout the whole United States. Just place an order on their website, but be forewarned, there's no guarantee the food will arrive hot. After an excellent meal at this local institution, it's time to discover some of the clubs that made the neighborhood's reputation. Among the best known are the Lincoln Theater, the Howard Theater, and especially the Bohemian Caverns, located near Ben's Chili Bowl on 11th Street. When the club first opened in 1926, it was called Club Caverns and occupied a drugstore basement. The public attending their shows came from all walks of life. In the 1950s, the club changed its name to Crystal Caverns. It finally settled on Bohemian Caverns in the early 1960s. As the name implies, the club resembles a secret hideaway hidden in a cave. It's reached by a staircase that seems to lead straight to the center of the earth. Stalactites hang from the ceiling and the walls are decorated with strange subterranean faces. All the great names in jazz and soul music have appeared on this small stage, such as Duke Ellington, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Louis Armstrong, Cab Calloway, Aretha Franklin, and Billie Holiday. Today, the club owners occupy the entire building. There's a restaurant on the ground floor, which is also home to two great clubs and a top DJ. In the basement, Bohemian Caverns continues Washington's jazz legacy in a relaxed setting. great artists, the club has had its own house band, the Bohemian Caverns Jazz Orchestra, that plays every Monday night. Don't stay up too late at the clubs. Our list of bests includes a morning visit to a Washington suburb with some very interesting ways to commute. Let's continue our discovery of the U.S. federal capital in Georgetown, an upscale Washington neighborhood where people have different ways of getting around. Senior officials, diplomats, and many of Washington's elite have settled in large numbers in Georgetown, as have the embassies of several countries. Georgetown's name refers to King George II of England, and surprisingly not George Washington. In fact, this town, formerly known as the Town of George, is much older than the city of Washington. It was integrated into the District of Columbia in 1871, a few years after the end of the Civil War. The suburb's gentrification began in the 1930s and accelerated after World War II when John F. Kennedy, then a senator, settled here. Most new residents are part of the elite, attracted by the historic atmosphere of Georgetown and its proximity to the capital. Today, the suburb is completely restored, and several former industrial facilities along the Potomac River have been converted into luxury condos. 
Wisconsin Avenue and M Street are the main shopping streets with many high-end boutiques, bars, and restaurants. Georgetown is a charming area, perfect for a pleasant stroll to admire the beautiful houses steeped in history. Located on M Street, the Old Stone House, built in 1765, is one of the oldest houses in Washington. Made of granite and brick with solid oak beams, its architecture is typical of homes built by European settlers in the New World. Many of the smaller houses initially had a store and a kitchen on the ground floor, with the building's upper floor serving as living space. The old stone house was purchased by the American government in 1953. Now fully restored, it currently houses a museum showcasing the area's typical rustic lifestyle around the time of its construction. Among the buildings that stand out on M Street is this set of houses built by Thomas Sim Lee, a personal friend of George Washington. These homes were among the first to be renovated in the 1950s. This is N Street, one of the most beautiful of the area. Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy lived at number 3017 after the 1963 assassination of her husband, President John F. Kennedy. A little to the north off Volta Place is a quiet little alley, Pomander Walk. It's lined with 10 houses built at the end of the 19th century, all of which have been restored. This little oasis of calm is one of the best kept secrets in town. Let's stay in Georgetown a little longer to visit one of the many homes that are part of the city's historical heritage. Tudor Place is a beautiful property built between 1805 and 1816. It initially belonged to tobacco merchant Thomas Peter and his wife Martha Custis Peter, daughter of Martha Washington, the wife of the first president of the United States. The Peter family played a key role in the federal capital's history and has long been involved in politics and business. Among the major figures to have visited Tudor Place are the Marquis de Lafayette, Daniel Webster, John C. Calhoun, and Henry Clay. The house owned by the Peter family for six generations was transferred to the Tudor Foundation in 1983. This is a splendid American neoclassical style home erected on a hill in the middle of a large park. Its architect is none other than Dr. William Thornton, the designer of the Capitol building. Over the years, the Peter family has amassed an impressive collection of American and European artifacts. Visitors can see paintings, furniture, dishes, and even some of the written correspondence of George and Martha Washington. The Tudor Place rooms also contain furniture, paintings, and sculpture that belong to each generation of the house's occupants. While most historic homes reflect the tastes and habits of a single owner, here we find a glimpse into the domestic and social life of an American family over almost two centuries. One of the jewels of this extraordinary collection is housed in the garage a 1919 Pierce Arrow Model 48 B5 Roadster. Originally, the land on which the house was built included an orchard, a vegetable garden, and a cow pasture. Although the grounds are now somewhat smaller, the park around the home remains well worth a visit. Visitors come to admire the statues and fountains around the grounds of this unique property, a tangible part of America's history. Dumberton House is another home in Georgetown with a fascinating history, and it's another of our bests. In 1703, the government of Maryland provided a huge lot to a Scottish immigrant named Ninian Beale, who christened it the Rock of Dumberton in memory of his native land. 
In 1798, local land developer Samuel Jackson bought a portion of the land to build a house which he named Bellevue. A few years later, this was acquired by Joseph Norse, first secretary of the U.S. Treasury, who settled here with his family. In 1813, Charles Carroll, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, became the new owner. When British troops were advancing on Washington, Dolly Madison, wife of President James Madison, was forced to flee the burning White House and found refuge here at the home of Charles Carroll. Then in 1915, the city of Washington underwent major town planning and opted to extend Q Street, and the entire house was moved 100 feet. The National Society of the Colonial Dames of America is an association that deals with the preservation and enhancement of historic American sites. It bought the house in 1928 as its headquarters and renamed it Dumberton House in tribute to the land's first owner. Today, the completely restored building has regained its original appearance from the time when the United States was a young, emerging nation. Visitors can admire a large collection of artifacts here, including furniture, tables, dishes, and silverware, dating mostly from the period of 1790 to 1830. Hopefully our tour of Washington has helped you work up an appetite for some top-notch food. In that case, you definitely don't want to miss our list's next best. We're in the heart of Washington's chic suburb, Georgetown, not far from Constitution Gardens. Let's head over to the nearby Latham Hotel. It houses the Citronelle Restaurant, home base for chef Michel Richard. Winner of many international prizes, the celebrated chef prepares exceptional culinary creations here. Though the master chef himself is not always present, his well-trained team more than meets the challenge of offering upscale and original cuisine every day. Soft lighting gives the dining room a pleasant atmosphere, where spoiled guests can enjoy the view of the wine cellar as well as of the busy cooks at work. The success of Citronelle lies in its dynamic combination of some of the most diverse culinary influences. Diners will find aromas of classic French cuisine mixed with flavors inspired by Asia and America, while even incorporating elements of popular cuisine. The results pleasantly surprise the taste buds. The visual impact of your meal is not neglected, with the presentation of each dish also given particular attention. Their main idea is always to deliver the unexpected, like this delicious coconut pastry that looks more like a fried egg breakfast. A true gourmet restaurant must have an exceptional wine collection, and Citronelle is no exception. Its cellar has 8,000 bottles from 300 different regions. Reds and whites are kept in separate rooms, and prices range from $45 to $5,000 for a bottle of 2005 Romanée Conti. This mecca of gastronomy attracts many of the most prominent personalities from the worlds of politics, business, and entertainment. It's also presidential couple Barack and Michelle Obama's favorite restaurant, with this alcove table reserved for them. Don't expect to bump into them, however, or even to sit nearby, as the first couple is always accompanied by several bodyguards who limit access to the restaurant. Citronelle is one of Washington's finest restaurants, but there's another place that's much more accessible and offers its share of surprises too. It's our next best, the Main Avenue Fish Market. This fish and seafood market is also known as the Wharf. It's located just a few blocks from the historic center of town, along the Potomac River and in the shadow of Highway 395. In operation for more than 200 years, this is one of the last open-air fish markets on the U.S. East Coast. 
You'll find everything from sole to tuna, crab and shrimp to catfish. Prices vary according to the season, but generally remain a great deal. It's on our list of bests for several reasons. First, it stands in refreshing contrast to the formal side of Washington. You probably won't see diplomats or government officials here. Just workers and everyday families surrounded by a cacophony of activity. It's the perfect place for people watching. And above all, this is a place to eat. Fresh oysters are available, and the local specialty, steamed blue crab, a delicious snack as you explore the market. The market is open every day of the year, no exceptions, but the weekend is when you'll find the largest selection of fish and seafood. Those seeking the freshest catch come in the early morning, but for the atmosphere, nothing beats the lunch hour. This is when the crowd is the largest, and with the shouts of the happy merchants, there's a real carnival atmosphere. The Main Avenue Fish Market offers an unexpectedly relaxed side of Washington that should not be missed, whether you're a fish lover or not. For our next Washington Best, we'll visit the home of the man for whom this great city is named. Visitors to Washington may be surprised to learn that the man for whom it was named didn't actually live here for very long. To get better acquainted with this fascinating man, let's head south to Mount Vernon in Virginia, the most visited historic site in the U.S. This home is where George Washington spent most of his life. The house is set in a huge field of over 3,000 hectares along the Potomac River. Acquired by his great-grandfather in 1674, the area was called Little Hunting Creek Plantation. George Washington once wrote, no property in the United States is more pleasantly situated than this. And when you see the beautiful landscape stretching in front of the main house where he lived with his family, you'll certainly agree. Washington worked tirelessly for nearly a half century, improving the appearance of the house, outbuildings, and gardens. Apart from the Revolutionary War and his years spent in Washington as a politician, he lived most of his life at Mount Vernon. In Washington's time, the place was made up of five independent farms and could survive in virtual self-sufficiency. They cultivated oats, corn, and wheat, as well as cotton and silk, with cows to provide milk and butter. Wine came from vines up on the hill. There was even a shoemaking facility and a smokehouse for preserving fish. As well as being a soldier and a politician, Washington was also a businessman and a farmer. He considered 18th century agricultural practices to be archaic, so he implanted innovative methods such as crop rotation and the fertilization of the land to increase output. He also introduced the mule rather than the horse as the preferred farm work beast. More than a hundred slaves worked on the property and were emancipated by his widow, Martha, after his death. Here are the women's quarters, where the main house's female maids and servants lived. The first president of the United States spent eight years as head of the country, then withdrew from public life in 1797 to spend his last peaceful years at the Virginia plantation he loved so much. Unfortunately, his retirement didn't last long, as he died there two years later. After his death, the home remained in the Washington family possession for several years, but was gradually let go. In 1853, Anne Pamela Cunningham saved the area from ruin. She founded the Mount Vernon Ladies Association and began a campaign to purchase and restore the plantation. Today, Mount Vernon welcomes more than a million visitors a year. It's a fascinating journey into the past of one of the most important figures in the history of the United States. We hope you enjoyed this stopover in Washington and that our 15 bests have convinced you to come visit this heart of the American nation. We'll be heading to another great city soon with another list in hand for our next 15 travel bests.